Our second panel is called Our Collective Fight and Resilience Amidst an Embattled <laughs> Landscape. Um, this panel seeks to highlight the impact of recent harmful see. narrative and policies such as book bans and anti-black um, and LGBTQ plus inclusivity on students, families, districts, and school staff. Um, and panelists, panelists will also share about the current efforts to combat these attacks at both the state and local levels. Um, and this is led by our moderator, Dr. Carl Cohn. Um, and a little bit about him, he's a professor um, and senior research fellow at Claremont Graduate University. Um, he previously served the state of California as a state board. Um, so without further ado, please give it up for our next panelist. Thank you. Let's get in to the real topic. Here we go. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce our three distinguished panelists. Brooklyn Anderson is president of the Black Student Union at Chaparral High School in Temecula, California. She's currently in her senior year. She has organized walkouts and spoken at several school board meetings for the past year. She is a leader in and out of the classroom and uses her platform to show that student voices matter. And she told me this morning that she'll be continuing her education at Cal State Fullerton. I'm a Titan. I'm a Titan again. <laughs> <laughs> Edgar Zazueta is the executive director of the Association of California School Administrators, known as AXA. He served as AXA's senior director of policy and governmental relations beginning in 2015 and was appointed as executive director in 2022. Prior to AXA, Edgar served as chief of external affairs for LA Unified and has also worked as a legislative consultant for State Senator Denise Moreno Duchene. To his left is assembly member Corey Jackson of the 60th Assembly District California State Assembly. He represents Riverside County in that assembly district. He currently serves as chair of Budget Subcommittee Number Two on Human Services. Assemblymember Jackson served on the Riverside County Board of Education in 2020, and he's also the founder and chief executive officer of SBX Youth and Family Services. All three of our panelists are deeply involved in what's unfolding in our country, nationally and statewide. We're seeing the politicization of public education and the rise of harmful narratives and policies that undermines schools' efforts to in create inclusive spaces for all of California's diverse children. From the recent Supreme Court strike down of affirmative action, state and local battles over curriculum, forced outings, book bans, parental notifications. So all of this is about coming together to talk about how we can best serve all students. Before we begin, I'd like to draw your attention to our Slido, through which we will take questions from the audience for our live Q&A that will occur later in the panel. On the screen, you will see instructions for accessing Slido which you can access through either the QR code or the provided access number. We invite you to submit your questions throughout the panel and we will do our best to get to as many as we can 
during our Q&A section. At the heart of these national, state, and local conversations and tensions are real students who find themselves within the crosshairs, which is why we want to hear from our young person first as we engage in this conversation. And I want you to know I have been present at all of these raucous school board meetings in Southern California. And the very first place that I went to back in December of 2022 was the Temecula Valley School Board meeting. And that was actually the first time I heard Brooklyn speak. So Brooklyn, what is it like to be there in the thick of these attacks on public education. We've seen classrooms, teachers, and students in Temecula directly impacted. What has all this meant for you and your fellow classmates as you're watching these battles unfold? Well, a lot of what happens in Temecula is rooted in racism. Um, Temecula, California, it's located in Southern California, but um, it is a mainly conservative area. So a lot of these attacks that have come from the school board add on to problems that already exist in Temecula, such as racism in schools, like students being called the N-word in the hallways as a joke, or like being called blacky to their face and stuff like that. There's not a lot of education from K through 12 in Temecula that focuses on how students feel about racism or even just educating people on racism on the impacts of their actions. But when the school board came in and a lot of those attacks started to happen, you could feel a shift when it came towards black and brown students on campus and how safe they felt and also how seen and heard they felt because we'd see our school district in the news like every other month about um, the CRT ban, then the forced outing policy, then the flag bans and stuff like that, students started to feel uneasy. And me, myself, I started to notice my own BSU members talk more and more about the racism they faced on campus, and it felt like it skyrocketed, and it felt like a lot of the attacks that were happening, the people that it came from, almost felt emboldened by the fact that there was so much um, unrest in our district. And does it keep you from learning what you could be learning? I feel like it does definitely impact the learning environment, um, especially at a high school level, because I've had um, friends that don't go to my school, um, but go to a different high school, talk about how they might have written an essay on the impact of being black and being um, biracial or mixed race, and someone in the class will later on like go to mock them and mock their essay. And then that hinders students from wanting to use education to speak about their own personal lives, their own personal beliefs, because you feel like you'll get pushback from your fellow classmates and your fellow peers. And I think that that does affect your own education because it hinders you from being in the classroom and wanting to use your education to also connect to your real life and connect to your own personal experiences, especially in the English and history classrooms because a lot of that does connect to you as a person. Yeah. Edgar, when you look at this, you've got district leaders, site leaders, staff, also on the front lines of these tensions. What have been the unique challenges and impact that school systems, their leaders and staff have experienced, and what's happening on the ground that the general public might not be aware of? Yeah, well, thank you, Dr. Cohen, and uh, thank you to Catalyst for just putting on, I feel lucky to be part of this panel. I mean, just the fact that we have Brooklyn here, here from the student perspective and, and on the ground, Temecula in, in so many ways being the epicenter of so many of the issues that, that we've heard, and obviously assembly member trying to take this on uh, from a, a statewide perspective, and I know you're the moderator today, but if they, you know, I know you have opinions on this issue. I know you, you know, anybody that hasn't heard uh, Carl Cohen on this, there's probably nobody following this from the academic and political perspective uh, than Dr. Cohen. So I know we've we benefited from from your perspectives on this issue 
as an organization and as a field. Uh, I think to your question, I mean, the short answer and uh, uh, I'm probably saying the obvious is that it's probably never been a tougher time for educators, right? From, from the teachers, from the classified employees that we were hearing from our colleagues here in the panel before to obviously now uh, the, the, the leaders, which is, it, and it's now a cumulative effect, right? Which in so many ways, the issues that we were fighting about in 2020, I know we were on this panel or when we were forced to do some of the, the online versions of this conference, we were talking about similar questions, but we were talking about fighting over masks or fighting over uh, mitigation efforts. And in, uh, there's a direct correlation. In some of these communities, what were once fights about those COVID restrictions have turned into fights about the things that Brooklyn was talking about, uh, that Dr. Cohen was talking about, right? And, and I think that, unfortunately, is getting bigger. It's not getting, it's not getting smaller. It's not isolated to, to some of these communities. It's funny because I get the chance to work with a lot of our colleagues around the country, and you think of California, and it's all those perceptions of California that, that folks who don't live in California may have. Oh, well, you guys are a real liberal state, and it's all blue, and you must think this way, right? And and I think where we where we've really seen that that no, this is a very very diverse state, also diverse in terms of how people feel about some of these issues. I used to call them cultural wars that we're having. I I try to change my my how I describe this, you know, also to try to temper down. The, the, the climate, if you will, that they are differences, right? Uh, they are cultural differences in many ways. I, I would really, really like to think that folks who think differently about these issues, it's that they still want the best for our students. Now, how we actually get there, I think that's where some of the challenges. Just in summary, to directly to our question, it just made that job of the educator so much harder, right? And we're seeing this play out in so many ways in terms of folks leaving the system, folks who, you know, let's take, in my opinion, one of the, you know, and I'm biased because I represent administrators, I would say one of the hardest positions in the whole system is that of a school principal because you're supposed to hear you get hired to be the teaching and learning leader. Uh, during COVID, you were really a, a health and health, health official, right, doing contact tracing. And now they, they've been at the front line to deal with with all of the other stuff that, that's coming our way. So we're seeing it play out in terms of the pipeline. I know we're gonna talk a little bit about that, of just folks going to that. But it's also, I think that the scarier part now is just that folks are really thinking about what's my role? Like whether you're a school principal or even as a superintendent who, had been, who have gotten caught in the crossfire. I mean, the, uh, the, su the former superintendent there at Temecula, we, we came, it was one of the few times we don't usually get involved in board uh, superintendent issues, but we felt the need to say something about this. And now the, the challenge that superintendents, let's say, may have, it's, okay, well, what should I do? Should I push back against the board that, frankly, are my bosses? And what's going to happen if I push back? I'm probably going to get fired, right? But if I need to stand by my values, and then they have to think about, okay, well, if I get fired, who's the next person they're gonna bring in? And we're starting to see this play out as well, right? The, the characteristics of the new leader may be more in line, may be supportive of some of those policies that those boards are pushing for. So it goes without saying, it's a very complicated issue that I, unfortunately, as we have elections coming up, I think it's gonna get more complicated than less so. Sure. So our state is often described by the national media as the bluest of blue states, a progressive leader for the country. But the plain fact of the matter is we're in the thick of this. Um, and in many ways, California offers a microcosm of what's happening across the country. So Assembly Member Jackson, can you share with us the impact of this embattled California landscape from a state lens? Sure, well, certainly um, California is a mix of contradictions. Mm -hmm. And um, being one who grew up in the Inland Empire, um, I introduced the bill to stop the banning of books uh, before Temecula or school boards even were taking actions. 
uh, before that election that took place that brought those school board members on board. Uh, because mostly we started to see it in Florida and on southern and southern and the southern states. But I just knew that uh, it's only a matter of time that uh, this issue starts rearing its ugly head in the Inland Empire because it is one of the uh, most conservative areas of the state. So in the midst is uh, California as a whole, is it 100% a you know, progressive thinking state? No. Um, in many cases, far from it. But uh, did we hold up to California's values in terms of being the first state to implement a law to stop the banning of books? Yes. So I think at its core, in terms of um, state leadership and the preponderance of the electorate, uh, yes, we stand firmly against these, these acts. Um, however, there are still parts of the state who continue to have a different worldview. And I think the most pressing thing that we thought, and of course when I introduced the bill, it wasn't until later in the process that the governor realized I actually had the bill, and he wanted to uh, take a position, and so uh, he partnered with me to get it across the finish line. But I think it was a sentiment that uh, we are in a time where uh, young people are growing up with less rights than their parents did. That uh, young people are growing up in an environment in which uh, they are not growing up in a less racist, less hateful, less xenophobic state, uh, but has the potential uh, to be even more so in a way that hadn't been seen since, in terms of my grandparents, 50s, 60s. And I wanted to make sure that as a legislature, we made it clear that this will not happen on our watch. I think we need to understand that what we've been seeing throughout this nation is a political strategy. And last year, they were testing different messages to be able to use for this presidential election. So they were testing the banning of books, making sure that we continue to double down on Eurocentric perspectives, right, and worldviews, and continue to force the conformity of that worldview on our young people. And then also utilizing the LGBTQ community as boogeymen and women uh, to uh, begin to see which ones will take shape. Right? And so, and then because we started creating these boogeymen and women, because remember, if you can get people scared, uh, you can get them active. And if you can get them active, you can get them to vote. So, although we keep talking about this whole idea about parents' rights and, you know, uh, making sure the students are seen and heard, understand that. Without this political strategy, we wouldn't be talking about this right now. And this is a well-funded and well-organized movement that has been testing this for over a year. Luckily, we won the battle against the banning of books. Um, this year, uh, through the leadership of the LGBTQ caucus, uh, we will be addressing uh, the forced outing of, stu of LGBTQ students. Uh, that battle will be hot and fresh. Um, it'll be a heated time on the floor of the legislature. Uh, but we must understand uh, that this um, white supremacist, Christian nationalist movement is 
fomenting uh, political energy on the backs of our children. You know, I actually heard Steve Bannon on a podcast say, we failed to take over the government on January 6th, but if we take over school boards one at a time, ultimately we will be successful. And then he went on to say, because people actually care mm -hmm. about kids in K-12 education. So, Edgar, school boards have become the center of this type of power grab, uh, a path to power. What are you seeing? as the head of arguably the largest administrator association in the country? We claim it, so I mean, I, I will say, yeah, no. Uh, I appreciate that, Carl. Um, don't typically agree with Steve Bannon, but like the one part of that statement that I think we should all take a little bit of solace on and, is that last part, yeah. that it is the one entity that maybe in terms of government that folks care about, right? The fact that people care enough about our schools. Now, what they do with that platform, I think, is a discussion piece. But I think that's a, a, something for all of us to reflect upon, right? Because that strategy about that, it, in some ways, it's the most fundamental part of democracy there, in a local government, about what electing people and what's going to happen uh, to those schools. Board members, I think, is, is the heart of this, right? I think this is where we started seeing some of these pieces for uh, both of you talked about that strategy that we saw in a national landscape, frankly, played itself out in other pieces, uh, in other places, and now we've seen here in California. I think the piece with, with board members, we first need to realize, okay, this is just local communities are going to elect people for a variety of reasons. So I think first and foremost, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder that we all gotta wake up. If you don't know who's on your school board uh, ballot, you should probably find out, right? And get involved at that level, uh, regardless of what your views are, right? And I would say that to, to no matter what the audience or what that, it, it, that, that that's an that's a, a important reminder. And then I think too, based on that, we, and we've been trying to do, easier said than done, we've been trying to partner with the California School Boards Association and other entities to regardless of who gets elected to office to think about them that once you're in that seat, you are now part of the system. Whether you were elected to be, you know, to push against the system or take it in another direction. So what is it that you're signing up for, right? So we've been trying to really think about what is it that we can do before elections to do some of that training? What is the role of the board member? What is the role, you know, how do you work with your district superintendents? Again, I'm not naive. There is a, a, a playbook, if you will. There is entities that are saying, you get elected to the school board, you, and this, and then when you get a majority, and these are the things we're going to do. We're gonna fire our superintendent, you fire general counsel, you pass these resolutions on LGBTQ students, right? And we've seen it play itself out. The other trend, that we've been seeing around the state here lately is the attack on DEI offices and directors. That's now the new front there. We've seen all of these school districts who had put in directors of equity or, what, or called different things, that is now a new target where boards are eliminating those positions. So one of the things that this reminds us, and we've been trying to think of this as an organization, and I'll say to this group, because you know I don't want to stereotype, but I know I've been to this gathering enough, I know generally speaking where people's views are on these issues, that us that really believe in equity and believe in moving the needle on these issues, we probably have to be a little bit more strategic in terms of how we're going to move this work forward, right? Uh, we're feeling as an organization, not a week goes by now where I get, and some of these are our members, I'll be very, I'll admit that, where it's like, hey, why is AXA getting so woke? Or why, why all you have to talk about race? Or why is it you're talking about you know, like, can we talk about anything else besides equity? You know, again, I, I know where the group will, will feel. 
we, you can't get to the fundamental issues on academic achievement until you first focus on some of those fundamental barriers. But again, we've already had to think about, we may be, in order to reach, to keep this umbrella, to be the largest organization, we're gonna have to be strategic on how we're talking about this, not just to our partners who we know believe in this, but those who may be hesitant about the message itself. Yeah. Assembly Member Jackson, what should the state be doing about school boards? Well, I, I think that it's, uh, although it, under horrible and nefarious circumstances, we find ourselves having these debates, there are parts of these debates that are important uh, because uh, Governor Brown really instituted something that now people think is a holy grail, which is local control, <laughs> right? But then also, through the forced outing policies that we're seeing, the idea of uh, parent involvement and parent rights. Very important debates mm -hmm. that I think, as a democracy, we must continue to have every once in a while, right? But the idea is, and I made a statement <laughs> last year that kind of got people in a tiff, uh, but I think overall, I said that uh, local control is fine, uh, but once you start using local control to marginalize and oppress people mm -hmm. and to take away the dignity and humanity of young people, uh, you're going to lose that local control, right? So it's not an infinite right that school districts have. We as a legislature said that we believe you should make those important decisions at the local level, but don't misuse that power. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we've seen districts misuse that power. Uh, and partly we are to blame for that as a citizenry who was not take, making better decision uh, uh, taking our votes more seriously in the vetting of these candidates, right? right? Because remember, democracy works until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. And democracy doesn't work when we don't pay attention. Um, and so uh, these are the debates we're going to continue to have. We need to continue to now, we're starting to say we need to put continued guardrails around our education system so that we're moving in the right direction um, um, as a society and then of course in terms of the vision in which mm -hmm. California wishes to move in. Yeah. Brooklyn, <clears throat> whether Temecula, Chino Valley, Orange Unified, whenever I've gone to these school board meetings, my big takeaway has always been walking away incredibly impressed mm -hmm. with student speakers. Mm. And it started again in Temecula, where you and others went to the microphone and basically said, time out. I don't want my education watered down. I want the real unvarnished truth with regard to American education. So what are some of the things we're aware of in Temecula? Teacher was removed from the classroom because an optional assignment was a play called Angels in America. Um, what, is, what is it like to actually have this going on and you're a student there in your final year? Well, there's a word that's like been said a lot on this panel, and that's like parental rights. There's certain groups in the community that are based around like quote unquote parental rights, but then when you really dig deeper into it, it's just 
conservative parental rights. It's not parental rights of black and brown families or of um, LGBTQ families. It's for conservative families, by conservative families. And then we also talked about the mass debates and how that, like a lot of the school board, two of the school board members that are on here now, one of them he left and moved, um, but he got prominence in the area because of speaking out against like mask and stuff like that. And how that transfers into education for me as a student is that a lot of these groups do not reach out to students. They do not reach out to my BSU. They do not reach out to the GSAs on campus. They do not talk to us. They assume that students are uncomfortable by optional assignments like that. Mm. They assume that students um, don't like seeing um, like pride flags in the classrooms or Black Lives Matter flags. In my opinion, I don't really care what's in the classroom. It's more about what the teacher is actually teaching. And then when you are a student and you take time out of your day to go to a community panel where your school board has flown people in to speak about CRT after the ban, and you hear one of the panelists say that systemic racism ended with the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which just, I mean, it's, it's laughable. And then you see the school board members nod their head in agreement, and I just thought to myself, you're the one that's deciding my curriculum and you believe that's factual. And I think that um, the school board members in Temecula have let their political ideologies cloud actual facts and truth of American history, of my education, of other students' education. And although I'm leaving the school district, I have a sister that's 10 years younger than me, so she's going to be in there for 10 more years. And so um, I think that the school board members have allowed their political ideology to affect how students are taught in the classroom. And if you go against them, then you're a part of the woke mob or you're trying to um, groom children. And a lot of these buzzwords are thrown around in order to distract us from the fact that they, are tr they tried to remove Harvey Milk and then they said it was because he was a pedophile, but in reality, you know the real reason is because he was gay. They don't care about any of his accusations. They care that he's gay. And so I think that as a student, I've watched in real time how you, my education has gone from exceptional because Temecula Valley is rated really high with our school districts, with our educations, mm -hmm. and it's because of the teachers. But how are the teachers supposed to work and achieve that um, great condition that I've been in since I was in kindergarten, because I went K through 12 through Temecula, how are they supposed to achieve that with a school board that wants to continue to say all these harmful rhetorics just to appease parental rights groups in the area. So I think as a student, I've definitely seen that kind of shift in education, that shift in talk of racism, of systemic racism specifically, and how that affects your education. Yeah. yeah. Pastor. <laughs> pastor Tim Thompson is the head pastor of the 412 Evangelical Church and basically, he argues that whatever church has the largest congregation in the area is entitled to control the public schools. Do, do, you, do you ever run into students who are members of the 412 church? Um, and, and do they have any kind of a profile on campus? Do you know something that's actually like... This is so funny. You really don't. And um, it's almost comical because when I show up to these school board meetings, specifically the one that I mentioned where there was like a group panel um, at a local middle school, there was one side that was all students. And we were protesting. We had posters. We had signs. And then there was the si side in the middle that was the school board side. And I think I saw about two or three people in the audience that were students that I knew from my school. One of them was directly related to a school board member. It was her son his girlfriend, and then a few of their friends. And so, like, that was really it on the student side. When I think of all the students that I've seen speak at school board meetings, it's always opposing. I saw one person that spoke in favor, but it was almost, like, unintelligible. Just, like, he got up there and was like, oh, this teacher at Temecula Valley High School has turned students gay. And then he, like, hangs pride flags up to signify how he turns people. It's like, what are you talking about? So when I see students speak, it's almost always in opposition. I've met a 412 member that is like a coworker of mine, but she doesn't go there anymore. And it's not like she volunteered that information to me. Like something happened where like that just got brought up in conversation. But I, on the 
regular basis when I do go to these meetings, I've been to so many, like I've gone there for about a year now, I don't really see too many students supporting them, and if I do, they're very like quiet about it. They don't sit with them, maybe they'll stand in the corner, maybe they'll like clap when someone gets up to speak, but no, I don't really see like that many people on my campus that are advocates for what the school board is doing. Maybe they're silent about it, but they're not as outspoken. So the pushback is starting. And on March 5th, you had two recalls of school board members on ballots. Orange Unified and Woodland up in Northern California. And they were both successful. So the, the pushback is basically starting in the face of these attacks we're seeing fighting back. Um, so, Brooklyn, tell us about student activism, student walkouts, what's going on on that front? Well, um, my involvement in this really started last year with like the very, after the very first school board meeting. Um, my Black Student Union Advisor, Diane Cox, was talking to me about um, why we should encourage BSU members that are 18 to vote in the local election. I was like, yeah, of course we can do that. And then she told me why and who was running and kind of the um, power plays that were um, going on there. And so that's when I got more involved. I was already extremely involved in the Black Student Union at my school, being like social media advisor, helping planning meetings, stuff like that. But then I got more involved when it came to like, speaking out in the community about what's going on in Chaparral, especially with the Black Student Union. But it wasn't just me. Like, I really got into it because of my best friend, Genesis Kekoa, who goes to Mike, to Mike Valley High School. She um, had the idea of the walkout, and we met at her house with some other student leaders from another high school called Great Oak in the area. And um, I made flyers. I'm, we figured out, like, this is where this school will go to meet. This is where that school will go to meet. We're going to protest this ban on CRT. Like, if they're going to try to hinder our education, then we're just going to get up and walk out because it's not a complete education. It's not a complete and full education. That was why I walked out. I walked out because I read the ban, and it said, you know, that you can't speak about how racism is how society works. The ban said that um, you can't talk about systemic racism in the classroom, that systemic racism doesn't exist. I heard their logic behind it saying that white students would feel bad and that black students would feel like they were on a low social status and that they couldn't climb up. And so I just, I fundamentally did not agree with what was going on at all. So I helped plan the walkout. I made the flyers. My grandmother, she spoke there. She's um, a female pastor in the area. She's an African-American woman. She spoke about her experiences living in the South, growing up in Arkansas, um, actually going to restaurants, not being able to eat there, being scared for her life, seeing like the KKK and stuff like that, her experiences as a 77-year-old. And so when I think of the student walkouts and the people that were there, I strongly think of the Black Student Unions, I think of the GSAs, I think of the people that are at my school and not at my school that said, I don't agree with this, something is wrong, someone has to do something. And it was young people, like it was all student led. There was not like an adult there. There were adults there to help us, but we're the ones that made the flyers, we figured out the locations, the times, how we're gonna get everyone there safely, how we're gonna get back safely. The pushback on these school board school boards for us and our experience what we said was this is our education and we wanted to say something about it because although we could not vote we still could take the action of walking out we still could take the action of showing up to these meetings we could have protests there we could email them you know we emailed them so much that like they tried to figure out if we could get in trouble at school for emailing them so there was just like there was so much resistance and I'm so still so proud and like friends with a lot of these people now because when we look back at that time we just remember that we mobilized a group of students and told them that your voice matters and what you say does matter and your experiences matter whether you're black, gay, trans, or just like an ally, whatever, it's still your education and it should not be watered down. So a lot of the resistance has come from students by students for us. Yeah. <laughs> Edgar, how is AXA? involved in the pushback. Mm -hmm. Well, first, Dr. Cohen, I, I'm, I'm sure I speak for the, for the audience here. A couple of reflections here when I hear Brooklyn speak. One, it's for all those moments where we feel a little worried about <laughs> what the future looks like. I think this makes me feel a little bit better. 
And then part of me feels guilty. What, what was I doing in high school? Because I did, I definitely wasn't as. I tried to be an activist, but oh gosh. So there's so thank you for everything thank you're doing. You. On. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we we are trying first. So to, taking a step back, so like, what what roles do we have in the process, right? So we're we're in, we're we're primarily we do. I always <coughs> three buckets on what we do here as an organization. We train school leaders, right? So professional development is the biggest thing we do. We do advocacy, so trying to influence the laws both here in Sacramento and in Washington, D.C., and really trying to stay focused on what is in the best interest of students. Even though we're an organization that fundamentally represents the adults, it's really grounded on what's in the best interest for students. So us, and this is easier said than done sometimes, given some of the pressures I told you, making sure that we're really focused on that value, that that's our North Star. Right, regardless of what else is coming in, regardless of what criticism we're gonna get, that is really focused on how is this impacting the students in the classroom. And then, uh, and then we do legal support and whatnot, but I think the, the primary piece that we're really trying to think about, what do we need to put in front of our superintendents in thinking about what does this role entail? There used to be a perspective for superintendents, and Dr. Cohn knows this better than anybody, and I've heard him speak on this, that, hey, if you're superintendent or you're leader, you should just stay out of the fray, right? Let, let the board members do whatever they're going to do. You're there as a, an extension of the board, and that's your role. We've seen that not work so much in, in the last couple of years, where folks who that didn't represent their values, and they kind of set back, and next thing, they either are put in a position where they're now having to have these ethical you know, debates about, hey, I know what they're doing here. I don't believe in this. And then those, the flip side of that, they push and challenge and what happens? They lose their job, right? And we've seen a number of those examples. So I think training our leaders how to lead in this changing landscape is one of our biggest priorities. And then two, it's we are trying to be bold advocates. And this is, this is not, you know, it, the hardest part of our, our job now is the, the thousand school districts we have in the state across the 58 counties People feel very passionately about making sure that, you know, we're, we're representing everybody. And that's something that I do believe in. I, you know, we were talking, the panel before us was talking about rural schools and rural, rural, rural support. That's something I fully really important about. I got to make, and this is where we need to constantly, I think, remind ourselves, is our message resonating everywhere? I, and I think it's, whether we're from Los Angeles, we're from an urban area here in Sacramento, I think taking off, uh, putting that lens of how is this going to be perceived everywhere? I think if we're going to move the needle or there, there's equity needs everywhere in the state, not just even our urban areas, not just in Temecula, everywhere, right? And I want to make sure that we're not leaving those leaders and more importantly, those students left by themselves. So again, being strategic and how can we continue this message about equity and moving the needle on some of these fundamental issues but also knowing that we have an ever-changing uh, audience that may not be receptive to the ways we talk about this. Finally, Assembly Member Jackson on specific state legislative efforts to push back. I, I think we started that last year with um, the legislation uh, 1078 to stop the banning of books in California. Yeah. I think it's proven to have been successful thus far. Um, school districts doesn't, don't seem to have the appetite to put possible funding and budgets at risk um, to be able to um, advance this cause. Of course, this year, um, we're going to start seeing a legislative push uh, pretty soon to um, combat the outing um, of LGBTQ students and put some protections um, around that. Um, but then I think our role really, um, last year I just started to think about uh, two quotes. Uh, one from Benjamin Franklin that says, we gave you a republic, it's up to you to keep it. Mm -hmm. And then second from Coretta Scott King that says, it's up to every generation to protect their rights and to move to move democracy and civil rights mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. And so I think that our number one job, and I was even inspired to see 
uh, what young people were doing throughout the Inland Empire in terms of walking out and basically saying, I think that our democracy is only going to be saved by our young people. Um, I think that our young people are going to continue the tradition of young people before them uh, to hold the line and say, no, we're inheriting this society, yeah. so we are going to say what this society is going to look like. And then how can we in the legislature help to continue to allow that process to happen? And when we see people using government institutions to advance racist, hateful, xenophobic policies, our job is to get in the way, intercede, uh, so that young people can continue to lead the way um, as they see this world yep. uh, and what they wanted to see done. Okay, our first question up on the Slido is, how can we better support students and elevate their leadership in this landscape? Brooklyn, how can we get more Brooklyns? <laughs> um, well, for me, what was really helpful seeing teachers, adults, whatever, show up to the school board meeting, show up to the protests we were having and just be a face to say, we're here to support you. Like, we agree with this cause. If you need us, we're here. Um, one thing that I really appreciated was just seeing parents themselves and teachers themselves get up at the school meeting and say, you know, I'm a parent and I don't agree with this. And like, I think the best way to support students is to show them yourself that you're comfortable to do what they're uncomfortable to do. Because for me, public speaking wasn't that hard. I grew up in the church, so I would get up like every Sunday and have to say a Bible verse. So for me, I was all I, I was raised in a place where I had to get up and say something. So it wasn't hard for me. But my friends, some of them, like they're so shy. Like they they see videos of me going to school meetings. So like I could never do that. And so I think when you see an adult that you look up to, that you admire, that you see um, every day, and they get up there and they say something, it gives you the confidence to say, okay, I can do it too, because I admire this person, I respect them, they're a mentor to me, they're a leader to me, I'll say, I'll say my two cents and then I'll go sit down. So I think in order to support students, you have to make that step yourself to say, I'll be a supporting face, I'll show up and help them, because that's what's most helpful is guidance at a lot of points. Okay, and is this, is there a next question on, there is. <laughs> What do you feel like have been the most effective strategies, most effective strategies against these hateful narratives and attacks? And, you know, I, I guess part of this is, is recall ultimately or should communities try and solve these issues by bringing people together? I think it's all the above. But one thing we can't do is be silent. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And when our very democratic institutions are being used uh, to harm people, um, we have got to even be willing to sacrifice. Sometimes that sacrifice is our own um, places of employment. Sometimes that sacrifices, right? It doesn't happen. Not every generation has to sacrifice like that. But history is calling on us to be able to have to sacrifice so that others in the future won't have to do so, right? So I think as we have to speak up and we, we have to treat racism and hate and these things like we treat cancer, mm -hmm. you have to act quickly and you have to act aggressively, <coughs> right? And everyone has to do their part to eradicate that and push it back into the shadows where it belongs. Yeah, I'll just add to that, Dr. Cohen. Uh, I, I, I think like some of the members said, I mean, I think our, always our predisposition is to try to bring folks together, how, you know, but, how can bring community together and try to see if, if we can find commonality amongst differences. With that being said, and I appreciate how you put it, that what we can't also do is the flip side because this narrative and this landscape, as we've talked about, some of these issues, 
the issues that we're having in Temecula, now it's almost like that's the normal. That's that, you know, like we, we almost have an acceptance of it because it's having it's happening so much, so many places in the state. So I think we just also had to fight that urge to just be like, okay, this is just our new norm. This is what we're going to deal with. And regardless of the political climate and tenor and, you know, given what we know what we're going to deal with as a, as a country here this upcoming year, I think us in the school system also have to resist, resist that as well. Yeah. Um, I would say the best thing to do is to be extremely persistent and almost so persistent that it's annoying because um, what a lot of people don't like is pushback, especially if you're getting a lot of positive reinforcement. I mean, at these school board meetings, they will almost always people that are on their side that are holding like a little sign to say like no recall and stuff like that. But I don't think as the year has gone on with a lot of this, uh, what, with what's happening in Temecula, they don't get as much pushback as they did, as they did at the beginning, um, unless it's from me, because I mean, last meeting, and I think like meter, like a couple meetings ago too, I was the only student that spoke, and I've been, I'll get up there every single time and say why I'm still showing up a year later as the only student there. And I think it's important to just be persistent because as the year has gone on, now I see one member that has come to a BSU event for us. I see that the superintendent wants to reach out and have a meeting with us now and things like that where I'm seeing how there was almost a plateau where I was like, I'm through with this. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not seeing any results. The CRT ban is still in place. Like, even now there's even more like with the outing policy, the flags, all that. But what I've learned now is that the best thing to do is just to keep going and to continue to be persistent and to continue to show up and to invite others to show up, even if they're not quote unquote like on your side, have those conversations, have those discussions and tell them, you know, do you agree that systemic racism stopped with the Civil Rights Act? Like, just ask them those point blank questions about what's going on, what is factually untrue, because a lot of times the best way to persuade someone is just with facts and to show them, you know, do you want your children to learn that? Is that what you want your kids to know? And to have them go into the world thinking that, you know, um, our judicial system is okay and that systemic racism doesn't exist because that's not true. And so I think just pointing out the lies, showing up, um, trying to extend those olive branches, even if you don't want to, even if you don't like them, to say, you know, I'd like to see you here. You should come to this event. So I think that's the best thing to do. Okay, we have about one minute for closing <laughs> remarks, and we'll start with Assembly Member Jackson. Uh, you know, one of the things that I uh, realized, of course, I was part of a uh, community-based organization before I came to the legislature, and we realized that, uh, particularly in the African-American community, uh, that we only have a window of opportunity during the uh, uh, murder of George Floyd, and there's going to be a time where people start becoming complacent again. And it's going to be up to uh, many of us to continue to keep the conversations alive. And I'm reminded of um, Dr. King's um, letter from a Birmingham jail, and one of the most significant parts of it is, is that uh, we cannot prioritize um, calm over justice, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we can't say that, well, let, well, let's just keep things, let's just tamp things down, right? Let's just maintain order, even though maintaining order means the absence of justice. And we have to always prioritize justice, and we have to always speak up, um, even in those inconvenient times, mm -hmm. right? And if we don't, uh, bad things happen. People get hurt that don't need to be hurt. And so I would just say that... Uh, the fight is not over. We still have a ways to go. And whether it's in the news or not doesn't mean that the fight doesn't still exist. Sure. Mm -hmm. Edgar. Uh, where my mind goes is almost a, a, a bit of a plea to, to our friends here in the room to just to have grace, to have grace for all those that, that, that to give grace to all those involved who are in the system, right? From, from our teachers and, and those folks on the front lines to our classified employees who are working with our families every single day 
just think about we talked about all of these issues around uh, these per, uh, particular aspects. We didn't even get into the controversies of how you even teach history or, 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 or educators who have to try to make sense of current events in the world uh, that are happening right now, how tricky that is you know, for folks on the ground. Uh, not to mention, obviously, you talked about the challenges for our school leaders. So it's not an easy time to be an educator. And I think all of us collectively remembering that and that we really do need to invest. And when I say, we always talk about investment, we always talk about money. We didn't talk about money a lot today, right? This is a different type of investment. Uh, I think that community investment in terms of what's happening in our schools to just stay focused on that. Uh, and, and just like Catalyst California does, I think one of the beauties of these gatherings is to bring folks together from different aspects of our system, but with one commonality that we do believe in the power, in the value, in really the, the, the most immense power it, it is the influence that public education has. And if there was ever a time that we have to try to stay together, it, it, it's now. So I think just a, an encouragement to us to continue to stay focused on these issues. Brooklyn. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to me and I'd like to thank Catalyst California for inviting me. But I'd also like to simultaneously encourage all of you to um, notice the signs of like what's going on in your school boards. Encourage young people to get out and vote and vote yourself. I mean, the reason why what's going on in Smecula is even going on is because in one of the districts, only 19% of people voted and alarming rates of it were for the school board members, not against. And so um, just look at what's happening in your own local community, listen to students, because students' voices do matter. And um, you know, the fight is not over. Although it may seem a little bit bleak with what's going on, um, you know, Komorowski, one of the people in my school board, might be recalled this summer, and one of them already left. So there could be like a huge flip within this one year. So, um, and that's due to students. That's due to students, that's due to teachers, that's due to activists that had a pushback and just didn't sit back and let that happen. But thank you all very much. I would just add, I'm a huge fan of the PBS NewsHour and the White House correspondent for the PBS NewsHour is a graduate of Cal State Fullerton. And so I think we have in Brooklyn the next whatever. But please join me in thanking <laughs> extraordinary panel. Thanks, folks. <laughs>